Hello, and welcome to Exile and Bookbill's Authors on Tap reading series. I'm Javier Ramirez, and along with Kristen Gilbert, run Exile out of the Fine Arts Building at 410 South Michigan Avenue, Suite 210, where we usually we transmit from the store, but since the logistical mess known as Lollapalooza takes place right across the street from us, we decided to play it safe and come to you from Kristen's apartment. So welcome. Tonight, we celebrate Willis C. Richards and her debut novel, The Comfort of Monsters, which is one of my favorite novels of the year. Willa is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop where she was a Truman Capote Fellow. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review and she is a recipient of a Penn Robert J. Dow Prize for Emerging Writers. Willa will be in conversation tonight with Exile MVP Lindsay Hunter, who is the author of two short story collections and two novels, most recently Eat Only When You're Hungry, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, but I have a soft spot for Don't Kiss Me, FYI. It's a great short story collection. Um, we're so excited about this. I, I just want to say, uh, I'll let you guys get to it, but uh, Will, I just absolutely loved this book. It really hit me out of left field. I was uh, told by a friend about it. Um, it wasn't on my radar, and uh, and I immediately asked my rep for a copy and just plowed through it and finished it like at 3 a.m. And I'm not a fast mm -hmm. reader, but I finished it with an within a week and uh, I, I just, it sort of blew me away. Just the, the feel of Milwaukee at that time and I, that I didn't know much about and I actually went back and did some research and, and uh, just the, you know, the, the police going head to head with the general public or what was happening with, with uh, the Jeffrey Dahmer situation and it uh, kind of mirrors what's happening today, but uh, I just absolutely loved it. And it's, it, I love true crime, but, and I use it as my intro to selling your book, but it's not a true crime novel. It's 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 a really amazing slow burn of a of, of a gem, and uh, I just can't say enough about it. And I'm so happy that you're going to be in conversation with Lindsay. She's she's you guys are going to have a great conversation. I can't wait to to hear what you guys talk about. Um, I just want to say that you can purchase signed books by both of our esteemed guests through our fancy new website by or by phoning us or simply stopping by our store. We also ship anywhere in the country. Uh, we encourage everyone to keep their cameras on during the event, but please mute yourselves until the Q&A portion. Uh, and I'm going to get out of the way and leave it to the professionals. Please welcome Willis Richards and Lindsay Hunter. Have a great show, guys. Thank Cheers. you. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words about the book. Um, it's a crazy process, as Lindsay knows, putting a book into the world and um, just hearing from readers and booksellers that, um, you know, the book really resonates with is it, it, it like makes everything worth it. So um, thank you so much for having us here. And um, I'm really excited to, to talk with Lindsay tonight. And I am equally as excited. I, uh, when I heard what the book was about, I was like, oh, this is extremely my shit. I am so excited. <laughs> but then as you get into it, you realize, oh my God, it's even more than that. And um, it's, it's about place and it's about family and it's about sisterhood. I'm so glad your sister's here. Um, and it's, it's everything. And, and there's this, this mystery that's sort of unfolding as you go. And I just absolutely loved it. And I kept thinking like, she shot her shot and she made it like, that is not easy with what you did, you know, the structure and, um, and we'll get into this. Um, but I, I am just as a writer to writer, I am deeply envious and, um, and I just greatly admire what you've done here and I love it. And I've been recommending it all over, all over the place. I just, I just recommended it on my, um, podcast last week. So love That's it. Awesome. If you got, if you here tonight, haven't read it, you need to, and the people in your lives need to read it and you need to buy it from exile and bookville. Okay. Definitely. Willa, will you do us the honor of reading to us? Yeah, I would love to. So I'm just going to read a really short section. Um, and, you know, a big part of the book that sort of emerged later on for me in, in subsequent drafts is like the, the fallibility of memory. Um, and so I'm just going to read a little bit from, um, and the whole book is narrated by Peg McBride. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the story of her sister who goes missing during the summer of 1991. Um, which is also the summer that Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes were discovered. Um, and Peg's sister D, her, her missing person's case gets sort of wrapped up in the Dahmer crime, sort of subsumed um, and becomes a cold case really quickly. So um, the core of the book is really Peg sort of looking back on the summer of 91, sort of investigating and recollecting 
um, her memories from that summer. Um, and over the course of the book, for a variety of different reasons, her memories sort of become a little bit um, shaky and, and destabilized. So I'm going to read a little section from um, the part where she, she starts to feel that really strongly. The memories I curated so carefully for the previous 30 years became inexplicably, irredeemably strange to me. I'd spent the decade since we'd lost Dee taking care of my memories the way other people take care of their families, their homes, their bodies. I had sunk all of my energy into remembering the months before Dee went missing. And for the first time since she disappeared, I began to wonder if I had done a bad job. I felt a different kind of fear then. Certainty is like a drug, a great comfort. When it's lost, the effect is that of withdrawal, fever, nausea, sweating, headaches, intense unending pain, and above all else, an ocean's worth of desire to regain that which will make the pain stop. Thank you. Um, I, I, I feel like I, um, I guess I was shocked that I didn't understand until you let us understand that we were dealing with a very unreliable narrator. Um, and, and for me that happened, and I'm sorry for spoilers, but that happened with the necklace. And, um, you know, when she, when the, the police officer let her know, like, what do you, you know, this was, what happens in the book is that she believes she's giving this psychic one of Dee's possessions, but she's actually given one of her possessions and she has no memory of it being given to her at any point. Um, did you, did you know when you, you just, you just mentioned that you were, you were very interested in the fallibility of memory, but did you know going in that this would also be a narrator who um, was unreliable in different ways? Like, did you have, as you were writing sort of like, this is what happened, mm -hmm. but now I'm going to tell it the way that Peg remembers it. Or were you really just following with what Peg was, was showing you? Yeah, I think it was the second. Um, that's a good way of putting it. I think it was the second one. You know, I, I was sort of writing from her point of view and thinking like, this is very much what happened. And I was, you know, taking on that point of view. So in my mind, I was like, this is what happened. And then as I was, you know, really digging into her point of view, especially in the 2019 sections, because the book is, you know, takes place in two different timelines. Um, I realized some of the things that like, clearly were going to be either, you know, um, lapses in the memory or um, misremembering things. Um, and then that became very interesting to me as a writer. So I took a step back from that point of view and I started playing with that a little bit more um, and layering those things in in subsequent drafts. Um, but I think from the first sort of draft, I, I, ver I very much believed her because I was so sort of deep in her POV. And then I was like, I actually don't know that this is um, yeah. you know, happening the way that she, she said it would. That was actually my other sister, um, Emma. Just see, so <laughs> just so you know the. Okay, she probably figured it out. <laughs> I would assume. Um, hey, um. <laughs> I love it. This is great. Um, I was as I finished the book, I thought to myself, "Oh my god, I think, I think." there is a way to solve this. I think the clues are there, but it's, but that's not the point. It becomes not the point. Um, there's sort of like a satisfying, um, like there's just, there's enough satisfaction there with, okay, I think I understand what probably happened to her. Um, but what I think was so fascinating was that you were able to because a lot of in real life, when, when your family member, when a family member goes missing, it's not sort of that there is a thing that happened and you will eventually come upon it. There's a mm -hmm. lot of like, um, there's a lot of, you're bringing what you have to it. And, and in Peg's case, it's this sort of um, tension between her and her sister and, you know, these things that they can't say to each other. Um, and, you know, the not even realizing that she's missing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, then just sort of hitting brick walls and trying to say what you think is true and not being heard. And, and it's just, you captured that sort of bewilderment so well. I, I really feel like the novel is about bewilderment in general. Um, and I just want to know if you agree with me that there are, there are the clues in the book 
for us to figure out what happened. Because there's unanswered yeah. questions about Eric, the you know, mm -hmm. um, the Peg's boyfriend's brother, uh, and and these things that happened with Frank, who was Dee's boyfriend. Um, I, I'm yeah, just wondering I, if you. I think. I think I do agree with that. I think that, you know, I, I think this is a good question sort of in combination with the first about like Peg's POV and her like quote unreliability. Um, but I think even after sort of the, you know, refuse of the entire novel, like sort, sort of falls, um, I think Peg is still clear in her mind about what she believes happens. And I think because the reader, um, in the same way that I was as a writer is close to her, I, I think that the answers are there for the reader um, in the way that they're very much there for Peg, even though it's not like, okay, we have DNA evidence or we have, you know, necessarily X, Y, and Z sort of clue, right? Or right. piece to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that was something that I had to, I definitely had to, I struggled with it. I definitely struggled with it. Um, in subsequent drafts, but it was something that I felt strongly about that I wanted, even even having her as an unreliable narrator, I still wanted people to believe her. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, um, yeah. And so that was something I really, yeah, I really wanted for her um, and, and I hope it came through, but yes. I also know that it's a little bit, it's tricky, it's a tricky um, balance. Yeah, well, and I think you did it so masterfully because, uh, you know, it's like Javier said, and I said, like, people will say, oh, it's a true crime novel. But when you, once you start getting, you know, 10 pages in, you realize it's actually not that at all. And so it's, it's literature, you know? And so there, there are those true crime readers who want to know, like, this is what happened and this is how they got caught. But this is more about, this is so human. This is so, um, human in, in, in the way that it's about memory and, and the way that it's about um, what's believable and who's believable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and to that end, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the character of Dana. Um, what, how do you see her, uh, I guess, as, as a writer, mm -hmm. what, what sort of device is Dana mm -hmm. in this novel? Yeah. Um, so that, that's a great question. I, I haven't gotten that many questions about her and she is like a, character very close to my heart. Um, so Dana is Peg's niece. Um, so it's her brother's daughter, um, oldest daughter. And um, Peg sort of has an interesting relationship with her. Um, she sees her sister Dee in Dana quite a bit. Um, and that is what sort of like initially draws her to, to Dana. Um, and then sort of beyond that, like sort of seeing her whole personhood beyond those things that she associates with her, um, her, her missing sister, she sort of develops a, um, a close relationship with her um, on, on different kinds of terms. Um, and Dana sort of, not necessarily with Peg's blessing, gets involved in the case and gets involved with the psychic um, that comes to town to try to help them. Um, so I think for me, Dana was sort of like a two-pronged uh, effort. I really wanted her to be sort of like the voice of the generation that this didn't like happen to, right? Like it affects her um, because it affects her aunt, it affects her grandma, her, her, her uh, father. But, you know, she has a little bit more of like a clear eyed vision mm -hmm. um, of, and is able to sort of go back to like the case files in a way that like Peg is always going to the case files, but she's always going uh, to them with this like tunnel vision. Um, so I think that was one way I wanted to use her to sort of like get around Peg's POV. Um, and then the second part that I was hoping she would, you know, she would provide for Peg um, was a, like, a sort of like a way to love someone again in a, um, in a really like more selfless and like vulnerable way. Um, and to provide a little bit of that, you know, comfort of what she lost with her sister. That sounds really yeah. corny now that you're saying no. it, but... <laughs> no, not at all. No, I, I loved that. And I loved, I just love in general, the younger generation coming into something like this because, um, because they have their own ideas of, of womanhood and believability. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so Dana is able to come to it and, and, and I'm, I'm imagining Dana seeing her aunt Peg as kind of a mess and, and, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and Definitely. kind of fragile, 
but she's able to take her seriously in these ways and also to try to show mm-hmm. her things about herself that I feel like is so true of the of this younger generation in general, right? Like it's it's mm-hmm. a way of like you're saying it was it's a clear-eyed view of what's happening, but it's also a generation who's more open to well, yeah, of course your memory's fallible. Of course you were tra- you were traumatized, mm-hmm. you know, and just kind of getting at it that way. Right, um, right, right. And, and I, I think also oh, a little bit of, oh yeah, I was just, you know, thinking about forgiveness too, right? And yeah. I think that Dana can also provide a little bit of that where it's like the younger generation is like, you know, don't be so hard on yourself all the time, right? That kind of mentality yeah. of like, you were doing the best that you could. And um, so I think she also provides like a little bit of an avenue towards self-forgiveness that Peg isn't able to access without her really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I loved that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, and Javier touched on this, this book is so, I mean, I didn't know anything about Milwaukee and now I feel like I'm kind of an expert on Milwaukee after reading your book. <laughs> and I just would love to hear you talk about like what, what Mil- Milwaukee is a character in the book, right? Like, in, and we see it change and stay the mm-hmm. same all throughout the novel. I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about place and, that, and you know, like how it, how yeah. it functions in this book. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, a really crucial part of the novel for me. It was something I focused on, like in all aspects, whether it was, you know, research, whether it was like sort of like mood and atmosphere, um, this like the lyrical stuff, like I felt like it informed, and even the characters, like I felt like it informed so much of the book for me as I was writing it. Um, And, you know, I think it was, it was just really important to me to make it as rich and, you know, sort of like visceral as possible. Um, you know, I haven't read a lot of, but well, I, I can't really think of a book that's, that I read set in Milwaukee. So it was also like really important to me to, to try to capture the specificity of those really like, you know, um, important locales, um, things that I knew Milwaukeeans and Southeastern Wisconsin folks in general would just sort of you're like, ah, yes, I, I know this and I know that, um, you know, and I think like in the way that coastal people for like New York or LA, there's just like these touchstones and like everyone's supposed to know about them. Um, but I wanted, yeah, definitely to have a few of those local touches for, for Milwaukeeans. Um, but I had to do like, so some of it was very much informed by like growing up there, um, you know, the experiences I had, but I definitely had to do a lot of research for the, from, you know, about the nineties in particular, um, just to try to capture uh, especially the really sort of specific crucible of events that was happening at that time. It was just like a really, really fraught time for the city. Um, and it was like all of these issues that had been sort of like brewing for a long time sort of came to a head in this very strange circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So that was, do you remember that? Do you remember that happening? No, I, no, I was, I was one when the, yeah, I I was one in 1991. So I don't remember the summer of it. I, you know, I definitely have a feeling of like the vibe of downtown when I was like like a little kid um, and it has changed a lot, um, but I don't have like specific memories at all of like, and people have asked me too, like did Dahmer like inform how I felt about the city? Like, I didn't really know that much about, about it about the case either you know I knew the very sort of pop culture gory details that I think most Americans know right like he's a cannibal Mm -hmm. whatever Mm -hmm. um but I I went back and just really like I was amazed at the things that I didn't know about this case and just about the way that it really um affected the city and like all of the history that you know sort of culminated in this moment and then the ways that it's affected it since too um so that was all super, super important to, you know, to the drafting process. Um, I have so much research that didn't get in there, which is always like, it always feels sad, but um, <laughs> you have to, you have to stop at some point. So I was so moved that you included the Glenda Cleveland call, um, the transcript, because mm-hmm. it, it is mentioned in the book, but then you actually included the transcript of it. Can you talk a little bit about that choice? Yeah. I mean, I think you know, when people talk, so I'll, I'll guess I'll back up and, and talk a little bit about that story. So um, this was one of the more publicized events that happened surrounding the Dahmer case, where there was a, a young man who Dahmer abducted and basically attempted to murder. 
this this young boy, I guess he was 14. Um, he escaped from you know this this serial killer's house, and a group of women, one of whom was Glenda Cleveland, a black woman in Milwaukee. She saw this and she and her daughters were like, this is not right. We know this is not right. Something is off here. They called the police several times. They left messages. Um, the police did show up and Dahmer showed them like Polaroids um, of the child and was like, oh, he's my boyfriend. And they believed him. So and, and after the, the fact to Glenda Cleveland and her daughters called again, um, that's the transcript that Lindsay's referring to. Um, and they're extremely dismissive. And she pleads with them. She says, I know this is not this man's boyfriend. This is a child. We've seen him around here. This is our neighborhood, right? All of these things. Um, yeah, and I think it was just really important to me to like put her name sort of back into the history of it. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that sort of happened with the reporting surrounding the Dahmer stuff was like, well, this was just like a bad neighborhood and bad people live there doing bad things. <laughs> and it was like, well, no, like there were, you know, people, human beings living there. Um, and many of them had raised serious concerns about this situation, right? Because that was the other people said, how could this have happened? No one said anything, right? No, people, people were saying things. Mm -hmm. People were definitely saying things, yeah. um, but they weren't, they weren't, you know, being heard. So um, yeah, it was important to me to put that sort of into the the context of the the novel, um, especially as far as like believability goes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it really does. It really does. I feel like capture what you're what you were saying in that there were all these issues happening in the city, and we can all understand them and recognize them happening in our own cities, right? I'm I'm in Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. And it's captured, it really is captured by that transcript, you know, and it is such a, a, a jarring moving moment um, in the novel uh, that really, and it, and it does relate to what Peg's going through, you know, trying to sound the alarm about Frank and sound the alarm mm -hmm. about Dee and, and what she knows and no one listening to her. And um, mm -hmm. so I just, I thought that was such a beautiful choice. Can you talk a little bit about what the impetus for writing this book was like where did you start and is it is it much different from where you ended can you remember sometimes I can't remember yeah <laughs> I know right it's like you go through so many drafts and yeah. you're like so what was the original deal I don't even know anymore um yeah yeah I mean I like the the sort of impetus behind it was um a experience I I had with my 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 mother who um is a historic archaeologist and um she was working with a family on a cold case um and I was volunteering on that and it just like really you know it did a couple of things for me it made me think about like if I lost my sister uh you know one of my sisters like that um you know sort of the emotional toll of 30 years of that and like wanting to I, that's like the writer you know weirdness right like wanting to explore that um no one wants to, to explore that but I did um <laughs> so yeah I think like wanting to really dig into like what that would look like on a human being especially because when we talk about missing persons cases and we talk about like true crime so often the focus is on like let's figure it out or let's um like talk about the actual crime and it's like there's you know this whole uh, these, these whole families that are left behind, um, that have to deal mm -hmm. with this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other part of that was just sort of thinking about like, why do some cold cases just go so cold and like what happens there and what are the circumstances that cause that? And, you know, there's, there are a lot of them. There's so many, there's so many reasons that these, that these things become really, um, intractably unsolved. So I think that that's sort of where it started. Um, and I had always wanted to do, because I was interested in exploring that sort of like 30 year gap of like dealing with this on a long-term scale and like, what does grief look like over and like not knowing what happened to someone. It's not even, it's a very specific kind of grief, right? It's not even like you lost someone to um, a known sort of death. Not that there's any type of known death. Um, right. But, you might be wondering if they're out there needing you or if they did and you, there was a chance right. that you could have, right. It's torture. It's torture. Right. Right. Um, and yeah, all of the sort of questions that you, you know, live with. Um, 
So, yeah, but I think that a lot of the things, especially as I dug into like the Dahmer research and I decided to do that layering, um, that, that stuff really took the book in a direction that I hadn't necessarily anticipated in a good way, in a good way. Um, but it wasn't, it definitely wasn't always going to be like a Dahmer novel. Um, I mean, I don't think it is a Dahmer novel, but like that stuff came a little bit later um, for me, like in the drafting stage. And especially as I dug into the research and sort of saw how these two cases were going to um, inform one another. Yeah. Yeah. It was great because, you know, that was one big reason that she wasn't, that Peg and her family weren't given the resources that they needed because, because Dahmer was, you know, sucking up all the, all the resources. Right. right. Um, yeah. I, has your mom, has your mom read it? What does she, she has. think about it? What does she think? Uh, I mean, we could, we can ask her. I think she's here, but, um, no, we shouldn't put her on it. We shouldn't put her on the spot. Oh, Patricia. Um, I, I think she likes it. Patricia. Say it in the chat. Um, let's see if she's going to say something in the chat. You, you, you take I, your time. I can say something. I love <gasps> the book. Of course. I love every part of the book. Um, com uncomfortable in some ways, but certainly, um, it's certainly a challenging uh, book. Yeah, yeah. Thank I was you, just, Mama. <laughs> I was just wondering, considering what you do as a career, um, it's just remarkable how this, how your career has influenced your daughter's career. Yeah, and not in ways necessarily I anticipated. I, of course not. <laughs> none of them have followed in my footsteps. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> no, but I think it is, I think it is special. I, I, you know, b before this novel, I wrote a lot of archaeology stories. Both of my parents are archaeologists. Um, mm -hmm. And it like, you know, we all grew up with it. Like I thought it was normal. I thought it was like a normal career. Everyone was an archaeologist when I was little because I just knew so many of them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I like, I wrote a lot about archaeology. Um, and it's, it, it has really like affected my fiction in a very like weird way, <laughs> a good in a good way. But it's, yeah. It's been very special. I feel like those are such similar. Um, maybe this is like just the writer and me trying to be like, there's connections everywhere, but it feels like there are <laughs> connections <laughs> between a historical archaeologist and someone who's who's trying to unearth a story. Maybe yeah. it's just the fact that I use the word unearth. <laughs> uh, right, right. Yeah. Excavate. I use the word excavate probably yes. way more than um, most fiction writers, but I agree. I do think there's like a certain, well, and narrative in general. Like I definitely have talked to my parents too. You know, I think a lot of archaeology is you have to like go to it um, with a, with a set amount of data. And then you have to tell a story, of, you know, from that data of like what happened, who are the people that were living here on, um, you know, what, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think that that aspect of it, like, um, also, I think both of my parents were, you know, creative writers at one point or another. Mm. So. Well, 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 Patricia, <laughs> would you like That's... to read? Oh, absolutely <laughs> not. <But> they... <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> if you change your mind, we've got some time here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what has it been like for you to put this book out? Um, it's been, uh, it's been harder than I thought it would be. Like yeah. it's, um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I was, I worked on this book for a really long time. Well, I don't know, not that long, five years, right? Like five years sort of for the first draft and then another year of like editing. Um, and, you know, I felt very like strongly about some things in the book that I really wanted to keep, um, which, you know, uh, at the risk of spoilers, um, it definitely includes like the ending um, and also having the two timelines and these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, I think it's been, it's been difficult in terms of like, I think readers that go to it specifically for like a mystery or a thriller, um, I understand the disappointment. <laughs> um, Cause I don't think that it like, I don't think that it offers necessarily specifically what a mystery or thriller does. And I do think it's a little bit more of a, um, yeah, like I think Javier said it, like a slow burn. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think like those sort of like expectations of what people go to it for and then sort of like, you know, recalibrating because like this is always what the book was to me. Um, 
you know, I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> it absolutely. Oh, it absolutely did. My first novel was a book called Ugly Girls. And somehow mm -hmm. people on Goodreads thought it was YA. And so I got a ton of like, this isn't YA or this is trash, you know, oh, like this no. isn't because people had certain expectations when they were coming to it. And, and when, yeah. you, when you don't meet those expectations, some readers get extremely upset. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and it can feel as an author, it can feel like I failed or I didn't do my, I didn't. Yeah. Oops. You know, like, oh my God, right. I, in my next book, I'll do something. I'll fix it. You know, but, um, yeah, yeah. That, that temptation to be like, oh, yeah. well, I'll do I'll show you, you. like yes <laughs> yeah. okay but it's weird it's so weird because it's like it's not it was never what I had wanted to do in the first place so then right. like when people are like well why didn't you do this I'm like you're right why didn't I and I'm like no what do you mean that's not what I was <laughs> it is and 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 it, it's crazy how it can start to change um you have to constantly advocate for it and advocate for yourself and remember mm. all the work and the decisions that you put into it because it can take uh, 20 seconds scrolling on your phone to be like, Oh my God, what did I right. do? You know? And, yeah, and I think yeah. this is your, this is your first book, right? Like mm -hmm. this, and it's, that is such a, that is so daunting. <laughs> that is, <laughs> yeah. and, and it is, you know, it's not you, but it's you. Right. And, um, and, uh, it's just yeah. a constant reminding yourself like, no. Okay. Like I went to Iowa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I, <laughs> I am, I'm Willis C. Richards, right? Like it's because it's crazy. And, and that's why it I asked crazy. you the question because, um, in some ways, like putting a book out the best, the best time is the day you sell it. And then after <laughs> that, it's all like, Oh God. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I do agree with that. I do agree with yeah. that. You know, it's like, cause you're kind of at the, at the very beginning, the most excited. Um, and then sort of the closer you get to like pub day is like the, there's a lot of anxiety and like there's a lot of fear that comes with it um and like you say there's just this vulnerability that like before because you're so sad on like selling your book and you're like I'm gonna get it out there like I got this and then when you do you're like <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then, and yeah, then there's like the reader reactions too which can yes. be hard to uh, manage for sure yeah I think like you know your intention and then what the readers get out of it, even when it's positive, it can be completely different. Right. And mm -hmm. so that, um, it's hard, it's hard to block that out. Um, and it's hard to, you know, like the book changes once it's read, I feel. Yeah. Um, and you have yeah. no control over that. You stop having control over it, you know? And, um, but and I mean, it's hard. It's a hard the good news go is through. this book is so good. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it is so good. I just, that's, that's the good news for you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you saying that. Oh, please. I absolutely, absolutely loved it. I inhaled it. Um, I was going to save the reader questions or the audience questions till the end, but we have a good one here. Um, and it's from your mama. And it says, speaking of the two timelines, how and when did you decide to weave the two time periods of your novel together? And what were the challenges associated with doing so? Um, it came very late. Um, <laughs> yeah, That's shocking. I, know. I know, I know. Every time I tell people that they're very shocked. Um, yeah, I had written, written all of the 91 sections first, then I wrote all of the 2019 sections and I wanted them to be like a part one and a part two. And then I had this like weird, um, interlude that, um, had to die. But so, so <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was fine. Um, <laughs> It wasn't right for the book, but the, yeah. So I had it in the two, two sections and um, actually my agent suggested, she's like, I wonder if, cause one of the, one of the challenges with the two timelines was that the 91 sections were really propulsive and there was a ton of like spark and energy and action. And there was just a lot happening and it was like, bam, 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 bam. And then the part two, 2019 was like, it was slow and people were sad and it was mm -hmm. very, um, a little bit more plotting. Um, and so, you know, she had the idea to try to weave them together. And that was, I think, summer of 20, 28, 2019, um, that oh, she suggested that. And I was at first crushed and debilitated, um, moped about it for, you know, a couple of days, complained to my, um, my now husband and my sister about it a bunch. And then I just, I just went back and did it. I just, 
it probably took like two or three drafts after that uh, to weave it together, um, especially because like the worst part was like referencing things that, you know, and when you introduce a character, oh like that special moment of introducing yes. a character. And so having to sort of like redo and recalibrate those things, that was a big challenge. Um, but yeah, I think once I, once I kind of shook the dust off from all of that, it felt really right. And I think the sections did inform one another a lot better and they kept one another sort of like moving along in, in a good way once they were woven together. Were you so sick of it after that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think by the time, by, cause I defended this for my dissertation at UW-Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And by the time I did that, I still probably had, I think another revision. I was like, I think I have one more revision in me after this. Um, but then I, it's so weird. I don't know if you've had this experience where you're just like, you're selling the book, but you're like, it's, I hate it. It's so bad. Why am I? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you can have it if you want. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of a, a low moment, but then when it, you know, when it did sell, I was like, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> did it change much from when you sold it? And then when you edited it with your new, with your publisher? Um, it changed. It definitely changed. I wouldn't say, I would say the biggest one was the, the two timelines weaving those together. Um, and then okay, so that was after you sold it, you made that change. Oh no, that was before, oh, that was okay, before okay. I sold it. Okay. Um, but that was like the biggest change that I gotcha. sort of did with all the drafts. And then once, yeah, once I was working with my editor, um, you know, we did, we did some smaller stuff. Um, and you know, just kind of like fleshing, fleshing things out more. Um, I don't think it changed all that much, but you'd have to ask probably like my sister. She before the book came out, my sister was like, I just I just have to read it again because I can't even remember which one is the the published one now. I've read it so many times. <laughs> so your sister's your reader then when you're writing, yeah. you send it to your sister. Is your sister a writer? Are no, we talking about she's, Simone? She's not. Um Emma, but my Emma, okay. Yeah, my, Simone has also has also read the book. Okay. But okay. yeah, but Emma's read, I think, every draft of it. Um good lord, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm and very she's, lucky. And she's honest with you with her feedback? She is honest. Um, okay. it's mostly of the of the very supportive and positive nature, but um, but the, but she's honest sometimes. She'll be like, This didn't this didn't work for me or this didn't, but she's really gentle with it. Um, <laughs> which is nice. That is really nice because my sister would say, this is boring. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but I also appreciate that. That's um, fair, and, I guess. But it's yeah. like <laughs> Yeah. No, my sister's my sister's a, a hammer. Okay. Um, Emma, Emma has a question and she wants to know what's one of your favorite scenes in the book, one that sticks with you most vividly. And I bet Emma has an opinion. I know. Well, maybe we should ask her what her favorite scene is. Um, Let's hear Willa, you tell us, and then Emma can tell us. Oh man. Um, you know, there, there were, there were a lot, I think a lot of the ones that I wrote in the, this was a short story first. And I feel like a lot of the, like the very old scenes that were in the short story that like made their way into the book really uh stayed in my heart like in a um yeah just like like I feel like they really impacted me personally like as if I like lived them um so I would say probably those scenes in one of them is definitely like the um the fourth of July like the fireworks night um that that scene uh which you know I wrote and like this is probably weird, but I wrote that and it like didn't change really at all from the short story wow. to like ending up in the novel. Yeah. It changed where it like where it happened in, you know, in the course of the story. But yeah, I didn't really like touch it at all. So I would say that that one sticks with me pretty vividly. Um it's a beautiful scene. Thank you. Em Emma loves the scene at the bar when Dee is starving and orders a cheeseburger, no burger, and they get drunk and dance at the bar. Yes, that's right. Come on. Yeah, that's a good one too. That was a little bit of a later edition, but that's a good one too. You did, you captured the, the sister relationship so well that, that just like, um, almost a love that one can take for granted, you know, like mm -hmm. it's just there all the time. You never have to worry about it. And, you know, the fighting happens, but it's, 
mm-hmm. not, you know, just um, brush it off. Right. And, and, and that's, what's sort of so heartbreaking about when D goes, dis- when D disappears, cause Peg, I'm sure was thinking like, you know, we'll, we'll make up down, you know, in mm-hmm. a week or less than that. Right. Um, was it difficult to, to, to write that relationship? I mean, you have sisters, so I bet it, mm-hmm. it just sort of came naturally to you, but it, um, can you talk about writing the, yeah. the sisterhood? Yeah. I mean, it was, um, it wasn't difficult in that, like, I actually like the way that you, that you just put it in sort of like the way that you take it for granted. And, you know, I, I, you know, my siblings were like so much a part of like the air I breathed growing up that I, it felt if, yeah, like that comfort was always going to be there for me, you know? And so I think, um, and especially when you're a kid, right. You don't think about that stuff. You're just like, oh, well, these people are just always there for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think once I really started thinking about like what it would look like if, you know, that's how you feel and then you you lose that person, um, that was where the difficulty came in for sure. Um, and sort of the emotional weight of, of sitting with that and thinking about that a lot. Um, and yeah, you know, thinking about how much we do take for granted, like these small moments, like the one even that Emma mo- uh, mentioned, you know, that that we take for granted and then like for Peg, it's, those are the things, like the only things that are left, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that was something I really thought a lot about in writing was like, what if these moments that feel so like boring or like generic or just an everyday thing, like that's all you have, you know? And then they get sort of charged with this extra uh, electricity or emotional weight. Um, So those were the more challenging parts of it. Uh, I think for Mm -hmm. like Peg and Dee specifically, I definitely, you know, I drew on all the different sort of relationships, like sister relationships that I, that I have, or, you know, my, my mom and her sister, um, but like, it's definitely a combination of a lot of different relationships. Um, and, and specifically, I think like the competitiveness, like my sister and I don't really have that sort of thing, but there is this sense of like with an older sibling, I think you always think, you know, more, even though I'm not that much older than Emma, like you always think you like, know a lot more than you do and you sort of project that on and I think there are certain repercussions to that attitude that most people don't have to think about because it doesn't affect them but if you do lose that person I think you you would think about those things a lot you know definitely and you mentioned the emotional weight of writing the sister relationship and imagining losing it um and I'm sure there was a a lot of darkness that you were wading through as you did research into Dahmer and all his crimes mm-hmm. and what the effect it had on the community. How did you sort of, did you live with that emotional weight? Did you live with that darkness or were you able to put it away when you were, weren't were doing that, the work on this book? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I've kind of been, I've been talking to people about this a little bit more and more. I don't know that I always was like aware of, okay, I'm gonna like, dig into this and then set it down. Um, so it may be, so maybe some of it lived with me more than I knew, but I think that also because I, you know, especially um, when I moved back to Milwaukee after my MFA, like I was um, doing my PhD, I was working at a wine shop, I was teaching, I was working on my novel, like I, I had a lot going on. So I felt like, honestly, especially working service for me is like such a like a mind cleansing um, like experience because there's just the task like right in front of you and you don't really like ruminate or um, yeah, it's, it's a very and like, it's yeah, like, and it's just like a very meditative. Silverware. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I honestly think like in a weird way though, like it was, I was tired and you know, it's hard and it, had, it comes with its own bullshit. But like, I think in a weird way that was sort of a good antidote to the work um, and to like having a space that like, you know, all the, um, like all the women that I worked with were just awesome. And like, they didn't know a lot. I talked a little bit about the book, but we didn't talk about the book a lot, you know? So it was like, yeah, that was a good space to be in. I think while I was writing it, um, I don't know how you what your experience is, but I think sometimes if you spend like too much time around other writers, it's like, it gets, I don't know. Is that bad to say? No. I'm, I'm, I'm married to a writer, so I probably shouldn't oh. say that. But. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. My husband's not a writer and I am thankful for that. Yeah. <laughs> it can just get, get a little busy. It can get a little noisy. Um, yeah. It and it, it makes what you're, what you might be doing feel less, uh, 
I don't know, special or I don't know. I, sometimes I feel that way when I go on Twitter and everyone I follow is a writer and they're all talking about mm. words for the day or something like that. And I'm like, <laughs> words. I'm like, we're so dorky, you know, like, yeah. God, totally. yeah, I know. Totally. I, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. You need that, like setting it aside and mm -hmm. getting like a more objective view of the world. Yeah. Other stuff uh, happening besides books. Yes. There's a life outside of <laughs> the books. Um, are you working on anything right now? Yeah. I mean, I, I started a, a I started a, a short story, which I, I don't write short stories really. So it's, but that's my way of like, not saying that it's a novel before I like <laughs> decide that it's a novel, I guess. So, um, and yeah, we'll see. It's like, you know, the comfort of monsters was like a very, like it wasn't, it was autobiographical in that like there were certain details pulled from like, you know, small things, but like, it wasn't my story really. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had one friend at Iowa that said like every writer's like first book is like their autobiography. Um, Anytime anyone says something definitive <laughs> like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think like, but I, so I think maybe like my second book might be a little bit more like, we'll see. I don't know. I'm saying too much. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't have asked. I hate that question. And then I always find myself asking it. Cause I'm just so excited. People I want to know. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I want to know like when my next Willis e. Richards is going to come out. I'm excited to just start like writing something new again. Like I I'm, you know, I'm proud of the book and I'm glad it's in the world, but I'm also like, it's been a long journey with it. It's been a really long journey. Any sci-fi. Oh, <laughs> Emma. Oh. <laughs> Emma, is that your fave? Is she a sci-fi head? Oh my God. I wrote some sci-fi when I was like nine and I feel like Emma is, <laughs> and Emma is just like always been, I don't actually know if that was a joke or not. I think it was. Um, <laughs> That's when you peaked according to Emma. Yes. Get it was back great. to your roots. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> so. um, how do you keep yourself writing? Um, what do you mean? <laughs> You know, like, uh, I, I, uh, if I'm left to my own devices, I will, you know, do something oh, you else. Just, you, <laughs> like, oh, how yeah, do you, you make sure you're mm -hmm. working? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm actually curious to see, cause like, I haven't done much. I did some generative stuff this spring, which was the, the short thing I started. Um, and you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see how the pandemic's affected me. Cause I think my attention span has really gone down and like my distractedness has really gone up. So I'll have to see, like, normally I'm just, I just kind of like, you know, I, if I feel like doing it, I do it. And if I don't, I don't like, I'm, I'm not really one of those, like I sit down like every day and like log on or like set the timers. Like I, I, I secretly wish I was one of those people, but I like, I don't know. I'm more of just like, if I'm if I'm feeling it and it's like the space is there, then I do it. And if I mean, not, I don't know, that's probably a really bad way of going about it. No, um, no. I mean, I, I am wondering like once something gets going, like when you um, realize that the comfort of monsters was going to turn from a short story into a novel, mm -hmm. which I know you had to, you had to do this for your dissertation. I'm just wondering if like, then it starts to feel like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta get back to the desk or wherever you write back to the mm -hmm. bed or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, does it start to become more like propulsive as you're going or is it really just like, yeah. oh, I feel like I have something to say today? Yeah, I, that's a good point. I think once you get into the thick of it and like there are peaks and valleys with, with like, you know, first drafts, I don't know how yours come out, but I know like I had some really stick, like I had some parts where things were just flying and then yeah. I had some parts that were so sticky and it was like, mm -hmm. um, I was talking to my friend the other night about like, cause she was asking about like breakthroughs or places where I got really hung up. And it's like, I have this number of uh, 170, page 170. Cause that's like this, it was like the number of death where I like couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't write anything past page 170. Um, so, you know, there's, there's peaks and valleys to it for sure. But a lot of times if I do get into like a really good groove, then I can like, I can pump out a lot. Um, sometimes it can be hard to get in. Well, it is, that's not, <laughs> I don't know. What she's oh, saying. Patricia. <laughs> oh my God. Your family's so proud funny. of you. This is just incredibly beautiful. To see. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. This is very sweet that they're, cause usually in the chats, it's just like, 
well actually my first one I had like my high school some of my high school teachers were there Aww. which was very nice yeah Aww. um so I've had some hometown love which has been very very nice uh yes. Milwaukee has been very supportive of the book in general even though I know it's not it doesn't shine Milwaukee in the best light but the people of Milwaukee it does you know like <sighs> yeah 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 um does anyone else have any other questions for Willa and her wonderful book? And I see these links to Lindsay's book too, which they have signed copies. Yes, I did. I signed, I signed some things and mailed them to Javier to paste in. So please nice. buy them so he doesn't regret. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Please He's like, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> yeah. Comfort of Monsters um, is at is at Exile and Bookville. It's so affordable. Buy it mm -hmm. for all your family. And it's very beautiful. It's so beautiful. Well. And you know, I I um I was just right before this, I read a book called um What Happened to Paula, which is a nonfiction mm -hmm. by Catherine Dykstra. And it's about a woman who's murdered in 1970 and then like no one cared. And I think I've heard of it, yeah. Yes. And there's a lot of similarities because her sister tried really hard to get cops interested in it and tried mm -hmm. for years and years. Um, and, and so I, I was, I felt very fortunate to have read that book and then immediately after read this book, cause there was a lot of conversation there, but your covers also have like the same sort of like hairline and then no face. Ooh, interesting. So it's like, yeah, I feel like you and Catherine could have some conversations. That, that would be a nice, to each other. yeah, that would be a nice event. Um, yes. Somebody, that would be somebody nice should event. put it on Javier. <laughs> <laughs> all right well if no one has any questions i just want to thank willa so much um for talking and uh inspiring me anew and for writing such an amazing book it's truly wonderful so thank, thank you, you Lindsay. i appreciate everything you said and, and hosted me and um you're lovely and it was great to meet you like and i want to read your books i hope you like them i'm sure i will i know you can get them <laughs> <laughs> would you like a signed copy <laughs> i would i actually would I will it'd be great <laughs> and you said you ship you said you ship so oh, we ship everywhere yes yeah yes. it's a real organization here <laughs> this, is, this is a real bookstore okay finally yes <laughs> after all this time finally we're, we're it's official. very real it's very why real. who it's said very different <laughs> The person behind the left door over <laughs> yeah. Willa's shoulder. Someone's going to pop or out. Or the dog is hiding. Yeah, exactly. Willa, if you want to let your dog in, I'd love to see her. Do you want to see her? Yes. Sure, yeah. Why not? Okay. I, I don't know where she is, but I'll have to find her. What's her name? Her name is her name is Massey. I almost yes. sent a picture to the, to the exile on Instagram and was like, is it okay if I just like have Massey show up for me, but I didn't send it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. I know. Oh. If I can find her. Massey. Okay, what if Willa never oh, returns? She's come back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what if another she chose, version? She chose the wrong door. <laughs> what if another version of her comes through the other door yeah. in a different dress? <laughs> With short hair. Yeah. <gasps> Hi. Uh, Hi, oh. Massey girl. That's promising. Yes. Want to come say hi? Come on. It's also creepy because she can get see her. <laughs> you can't see her. She's kind of slow. So, um, what if it's going to make... be a puppet? It's a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> or a human being. This is my dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. She doesn't want to come upstairs. That's not a surprise. Oh, come okay. On. Well, that's, oh, that's okay. okay. That's okay. <laughs> come on. You want to come upstairs? <gasps> All your fans are up here, Massey. <laughs> I know, right? My family is probably like, we've seen enough of her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, she's making her way. She's making her way. Oh, she's like, I'm big. It's hard. She was, yeah, <laughs> and it's hard for her. And she was pretty sleepy because she's oh. always sleepy. Sorry, it's taking so long. Come on. Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what noise I'm going to make as soon as I see her, because <laughs> there's just no telling. 
There's no time. If she ever, if she ever makes it. It's still recording. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. Is it still recording? I feel so bad. No, don't. It's okay. <laughs> Javier knows what he's getting into with me. Okay? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Pussy girl. Come here. She's so close. She's so close. Okay. Okay. You're going to say hi. Oh my, god. Oh. oh my gosh. Hello. Oh, oh you're hi. so beautiful. Sit down. Good Are girl. you serious? Say hi, what a beauty. Her head is bigger no. than yours. Oh, I know. <laughs> my sister always laughs at that. I know. Just say hi. I'm going to say hi. She is so, so beautiful. I know you would oh. hate me if I ever met you, but. Yeah, she <laughs> would. She would, but she's a gorgeous girl. I respect oh, that. Hi. You are such a gorgeous hi. girl. Look how much she loves you. I know. Oh. She mi- I know. She missed me. Get down. She loves down. you. She's like, is it kissy okay. time? <laughs> oh, now Emma it's... says, Emma says the only time she's sociable, sociable is on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That is Emma, true. that's your niece. <laughs> how could you? <laughs> she, yeah, she has a big Instagram following. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm going to follow her immediately. <laughs> okay. So yeah. You should. Yeah. It's Massey the Mastiff. Oh, oh. yeah. I love her. <laughs> Get that head. <laughs> I know. Willa, this is amazing. I'm so, <laughs> this made my heart right. She got a little <laughs> too excited. To I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay, calm down, sit down. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can't believe we're having this right now. Oh, Matthew. Okay. And this is why she wasn't in the uh, Willa. <laughs> Willa, I love her so much, and I am so happy that you come did on. this. Oh, come on, come on, sweetie. Open the door. Oh, you are a star. You are a star, yes. Massey. And she's closed out. So, uh... <laughs> okay. I really oh appreciate that, and thank you so much. Yes. You are amazing. That was You're the best welcome. ending. Once again, thank you guys. Both of these here, we have them signed copies ship everywhere in the country. Um, and thanks again. This was, you guys were fantastic together. I knew it was going to be perfect. Thank this you is, so much for hosting great, us. Of course, of course. Was, and thanks for stopping by the by the store, Willa. And hopefully yeah. Lindsay will follow suit at some point and stop by the store. With all my um, kids. <laughs> so cute. We, have separate, we have different rooms. So <laughs> thank you guys so much. And thanks everyone for showing up and, and tuning in tonight. It was a great conversation. Uh, and we can be proud of it. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Congrats, Bye, Willa. Thank yes, you. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you Bye. so much. See you later.